Right, so welcome to Graduate School 101. We're going to talk about why attend graduate school. So a bit about what we will discuss today is a very brief introduction to the topic, an introduction to our panelists, our panelist discussion, and then an opportunity for you as students to be able to ask questions that you have to the panelists. So very briefly, why attend graduate school? Everyone has a different why. And so the question is, what is your why? Why are you interested in coming to graduate school? Whether or not that's pursuing your own kind of academic knowledge and interest more in depth, being able to be noticed in today's job market, being able to advance your career, either with a promotion and salary or moving up in management or leadership, or even perhaps networking and connections. So the question that we will have our panelists address today is why? Why graduate school and helping you really determine what is your why for wanting to come to graduate school? So without further ado, I would like to turn it over to introductions to our panelists. And I would like to get started with our, our first panelist. Perhaps if you could tell us your name, what role you play here at the college and a little bit about your background of going to graduate school. Um, before we get into the actual presentation. So I'm going to start with Dr. Um, Mark DeLarco, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you, Christy. My name is Mark DeLarco. I currently serve as the Dean of the College of Graduate Studies here at San Jose State. My area of uh, study, my area of expertise is chemistry. I'm an organic chemist by training. Um, I went as an undergraduate to a college named Bridgewater State College in Massachusetts, part of the Massachusetts State College system. And then I went to graduate school directly from my undergrad to get a PhD. So I didn't get a master's, I went directly to a PhD. And I did that at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. And then after that, I did uh, a couple of years of postdoctoral research at Harvard. And then ever since then, I have been a faculty member in a department of chemistry until relatively recently when I started doing more administrative duties like the job I'm doing now. So I'll be happy to tell you something about my, my journey and uh, some of the reasons why I went to grad school when the time comes. All right, thank you so much. And um, Dr. Maria E. Cruz, unfortunately, could not join us today. She's not feeling well. Um, However, we do have uh, Dr. Magdalene Irinaki. Please uh, introduce yourself. Yeah, thank you, Christy. I'm uh, Magdalene Irinaki. I'm a professor at the Computer Engineering Department and currently also serving as Associate Chair of the Department and uh, Program Director of the new Master's in Artificial Intelligence. Um, so my <laughs> uh, path to the grad school has been uh, Probably, yeah, not a, not a straight path. So I, all of my studies are uh, in uh, Europe. I studied computer science as my bachelor's degree, uh, then took a, a gap year, let's say, uh, to prepare and get a scholarship uh, that uh, took me to uh, UK and Imperial College London for my master's. Uh, while I had the opportunity to continue on a PhD there, I didn't like the weather. <laughs> the rainy weather. So I went back, uh, went uh, to work in the industry for a bit less than a year. And I realized it's too boring for me and I wanted to learn more. So I went back to grad school in uh, Greece and I, I got my PhD uh, from there. Um, and about the time I was finishing my PhD, I moved here to the US and I was, uh, I guess, pretty lucky to get a, a faculty position here at San Jose State 14 years ago. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I haven't regretted it since. Um, all right, so uh, I thought I would start with some general ideas about why graduate school might be a good idea for you. And um, the most obvious reason to consider graduate school is because of the impact that that further education might have in your career path and in the jobs you might get. And I wanted to really point out that there are three, real, three distinct reasons why a graduate degree might affect your career path. Uh, the first is that some types of jobs absolutely require a graduate degree in order to do. So for example, if you wanna be a professor at a university, you cannot do that without a graduate degree. There's just no, no option for that. Um, this uh, 
PowerPoint has a link. You can see where it says some jobs. And I believe we're going to make this PowerPoint available to you all. Uh, if you click on that uh, link, what you will find is there's a list of the kinds of uh, jobs that require either a master's degree or a doctorate at the entry level to prep to be to work in that job. And it includes uh, things from archaeologist to nurse practitioner. So there's a whole lot of different uh, career paths that require a graduate degree. So that's one reason why you might want to pursue graduate education, which is that the career that you want requires it. In addition to that, though, almost all jobs pay more when you have a master's degree or a doctoral degree. Even if you can get employed as a bachelor's person, you will make more with a master's and a doctorate. And on the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about how much more you're likely to make. And then the third reason, which actually is one that many people don't think about, but which I think is one of the most important reasons, more important even than uh, the, the salary, uh, is actually something that Magdalini mentioned in her introduction, which is she went back with a bachelor's degree and started working and discovered that she was bored in that position. And it's because the type of degree that you have typically gives you uh, some uh, different level of autonomy in the workplace. Many people at the bachelor's level are very uh, constrained with regard to what they can do. But if you get a master's degree or a doctorate, you often have much more flexibility. Instead of being the person who implements something, you might be the person who decides what it is that's going to be implemented in that job. And so it's a very different kind of a career path uh, based on your level of graduate education. This is an example of some of the salary increase that accompanies getting a master's degree with, uh, with respect to uh, the bachelor's degree in the same field. Uh, this, these data are old. You'll see they're from 2013. So don't take the salaries as being current. They're not. These are old salaries. They're almost a decade old. But the relative bump as a percentage is still true. So even though all the numbers will be higher nowadays, the, the um, percent bump will be approximately the same. And just for your information, these data are from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And you can see in the um, link up here, uh, the, uh, the full table if you want to. Uh, but as you can see, the uh, amount of additional funding that you get in your salary is substantial. And it ranges depending upon the career. Here are some samplings of careers. So there are uh, a couple of business category careers, a couple of, uh, or three education category, a couple of healthcare and a couple of STEM. And what you can see is that earning a master's degree typically will result in an increase of somewhere between around 20 to 40% uh, in your salary. So that's a substantial annual premium that you uh, will get uh, for that education. And so as you think about earning a master's degree, in addition to thinking about the career path that it will provide for you and the kind of work that it will provide for you, you should be thinking about the cost benefit analysis of getting the degree, how much will that cost and how will that pay off in terms of future uh, salary? So that's a serious consideration. I wanna spend just a minute talking uh, uh, very briefly about this very busy slide, which is just to categorize graduate degrees into types. There are master's degrees, and there are a whole bunch of them. There's Master of Arts, Master of Science, Masters of Business Administration, Master of Fine Arts, Master of Music, and so on. Um, and what these do is they provide specialized education in particular disciplines. And as I mentioned before, they tend to provide the employee who earns them more autonomy in the workplace than an employee would have if the employee only had a bachelor's degree. A typical master's degree takes two years to complete. And in most fields, most of the time, students pay tuition when they get a master's degree. However, there are often fairly robust financial support mechanisms available, financial aid, which is primarily a need-based support, and also scholarships uh, and um, fellowships and things like that, and employment opportunities, uh, which could be merit-based. These tend to lead to many careers in industry and many careers in K through 12 education. Then there is the category of degrees called professional doctorates. And these include things like a medical 
uh, doctorate, a doctor of dental surgery, uh, you know, a law degree, a veterinary degree, public health, audiology, nursing, uh, occupational therapy, and, and there are many other examples. These are the terminal degrees, meaning the highest degree that you can get in many professional disciplines like medicine or law. Most students pay tuition for professional doctorates and financial aid is often available. Typically, the professional doctorate takes three to four years to complete. So it's a much more substantial commitment of time than a master's degree. And this is the degree that uh, is required for many uh, professional careers, such as do doctor, lawyer, dentist, so forth. The third category of graduate degree is the research doctorate or a PhD. And these are the terminal degrees in many academic disciplines. So chemistry, for example, my discipline is the, the PhD is the highest degree you can get or history or political science. Um, in some fields, students pay tuition and in others tuition is waived. This is an important point. Many people don't realize this. If you're going into a PhD program, you will often have the tuition waived if you're in a science or in, in some other STEM disciplines. Uh, which means you don't have to pay tuition. And in addition to that, many of these programs will guarantee you that they will support you in the form of a teaching assistant or a research assistant. So that's a very different scenario than say a professional doctorate where you are pretty much guaranteed that you're gonna have to pay for that. However, not all research doctorates uh, come with those uh, benefits. In the social sciences and humanities, it's less common that you would get a uh, 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 that kind of a, a free ride when you study. Research doctorates are certainly the lengthiest of all the graduate degrees. They take four years at a minimum. I think uh, in the United States, the average PhD takes about 5.1 years. And so it's a very substantial commitment of your time. But this is the degree that you need to be, for example, a university professor, or sometimes to be a leader in certain kinds of industries. So with that background, I wanna to just talk, touch on one other thing and then we can go into a more uh, open-ended conversation. One of the questions that almost everybody thinks about at some point when they're considering graduate education is am I qualified for a graduate program? And I just wanna say unequivocally that the answer for that is yes. There are some people for whom a graduate degree is not the right choice. I'm not trying to say everyone should get a graduate degree. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that if you have done reasonably well as an undergraduate, you don't have to be a straight A student, but if you've done reasonably well as an undergraduate, if you have a strong interest in the subject area of your graduate degree, and most importantly, if you are willing to work hard, because that is the principal element of graduate student success, then you absolutely can succeed in graduate school. There is sometimes a misunderstanding that you really have to be a very elite you know, intellect to be, go on to graduate school. And it is true that you know, many people who are elite intellects do go on to graduate school, but it is absolutely not the, the common path. Uh, a lot of people who are very normal in their intellects are able to succeed and flourish in graduate school and in careers. So you don't have to be a super genius to be a grad, a grad student. Um, what admissions committees look at when they're making their ad, uh, admissions decisions are pretty typical items, grades. But as I said, you don't have to be a straight A student. Standardized exams have been traditionally heavily relied upon like the GREs for um, many graduate programs, MCAT uh, for medical, programs, LSAT for law programs. But what's happening is that over time, the importance of these standardized tests is diminishing and some programs are actually eliminating their requirement for these uh, tests. So you have to check with the programs. Letters of recommendation are an important part of the application packet. Um, and I believe we have another session where there's some discussion of this. So I'll leave it for that. A personal statement or a letter of intent is generally required, although I there may be exceptions to that. Uh, and again, I think we have a, another session where we're gonna talk about that. Uh, prior experience is actually an important part of a graduate application. 
If you have done undergraduate research, for example, that's a, a, a definitely a feather in your cap. Or if you've done volunteer service or done other kinds of uh, community work, it might be valuable in your uh, graduate application. And again, I wanna emphasize the most important thing for graduate student success is to be able to commit to work and to have grit, to be not dissuaded by the bumps in the road that sometimes, not sometimes, that always accompany a graduate, uh, in fact, any education, graduate and undergraduate. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so the only thing I, as you were presenting, uh, I thought about another reason to, to go to graduate school, maybe get a master's is to either specialize on a very particular area that maybe you covered very briefly through a class in, in, in your uh, undergrad, or even change careers. So I've had friends from college who went into finance in their master's degree from CS. And I've also had the friends and colleagues in the PhD program who were physicists. Uh, and they did a PhD in computer science. And now in AI, I get a lot of uh, applications for people who are mechanical engineers, for, for instance, that they've done the robotics part, the mechanical part, and they want to, to learn the computer science part. So that's another reason you might want to graduate school just to specialize and even maybe even slightly pivot on your career path <laughs> and, and get another uh, different perspective on something you have uh, liked in your undergrad studies. Yeah, thanks, Magdalene. I want, I want to actually just comment on that. I think that one of the things that I have found over the years is that people who have that kind of cross-disciplinary training are actually very attractive in the job market. If they have an undergraduate degree in one area and a graduate degree in a somewhat different area, they often have strengths that they can bring to a job that people who are trained just in the one area don't have. And so I think uh, it's, it's not only a, a good reason to go to grad school, but often it can be a very valuable uh, way of sort of uh, building your toolkit, I guess, as a, as a professional. Right. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Mark, for that really great um, introduction and overview. And thank you as well, Magdalena, for um, your input. Uh, I'd like to add for those social scientists out there, my own experience of getting into a, a PhD program in, in sociology, so social sciences that um, there are some universities that do funding that you're going to want to look at your like research one your top tier universities that are able to offer you funding specifically to teach or to do research they're more likely to have teaching assistants within those larger university classrooms and able to get some um, funding particularly to you and especially if you're a non-resident if you're looking at a university in another state um, there could be some funding that's available for you as a non-resident coming into that university as well. At least that has been my experience. Um, okay, great. I'd love to hear um, the, you know, we've, we've talked a bit about this, but I'd like to, to hear what factors did you consider when you were choosing a graduate program? Do you want to start Magdalene or would you rather that I go first? Uh, either way is fine. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead? Okay, sure. So as I said in my introduction, I've I've went I've gone to graduate school. Let's say in two different graduate schools, one for my masters and then another one for my PhD. And I actually forgot to mention I had started another masters, but then I got the scholarship and, and left. So the reasons, uh, what, how did they choose my graduate school? Uh, let, I will start with a masters, which is easier. So I had a list uh, of let's say good schools that offered the program that I liked. Um, I had done my research, so I applied to many to have many possibilities open. And then out of the ones that I got uh, acceptance from, I selected based on, um, I guess, uh, back then it was mostly ranking. It was a very good, it was the top uh, college, so I went with that. Um, then for my PhD, um, the process was somewhat different. Uh, so back then I, uh, I could get funding as a research assistant. Uh, so I met with a couple of uh, two or three different professors in different universities that were in the area that I was interested in doing my PhD in. And I went with the one who, whose project I liked the most. And I don't regret the choice because you end up doing this research for four to five years. So you ha it has to be something you love. So I went with a topic rather than going to a top tier uh, school. I, I went with, with it was still a very good uh, school, but um, I also went with the topic I found very exciting. 
for my study. Thanks, Magdalene. Yeah, um, so in my case, I mentioned this earlier, I didn't go and get a master's degree first. I considered that after I finished my bachelor's degree, I thought, should I go get a master's first to see if I can acclimate to graduate school? Is that the right way for me to go? And what I discovered is that in chemistry, it actually, if you're thinking about getting a PhD, you should really do that right out of the box because uh, masters, as I said, you tend to have to pay for. Whereas a PhD program, you will be supported both with the tuition remission and with the availability of TA and RA. And so it made much more sense for me, both in terms of finances to go directly to the PhD program, but also in terms of time. Because even when you complete a master's degree and then go on to a PhD, the, the master's degree does not reduce two years on the PhD. It might reduce it by a year if you're lucky, but not more than that. And so if you're confident that you want to get a PhD, then you should really consider enrolling in a PhD program right out of the box. Um, another factor to consider is that if you uh, do go into a PhD program um, and you discover that it's not for you, it's relatively easier to go back and say, okay, I'm just gonna take a master's and then go on. So moving from a PhD program to a master's program is, is easier than going the other way, typically. Not, I won't say it's hard to go from master's to PhD, but it has bumps, financial bumps. Um, in my case, uh, I was very interested in a particular area uh, and I didn't really know that except that I had a wonderful mentor as an undergraduate and my undergraduate mentor knew that I wanted to go to graduate school and um, basically took me to a conference when I was a junior uh, and he, 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 was an, he was amazing. He basically put me in his car me and one other student and drove us for about an hour and a half to this conference. And we saw this all day conference. And one of the people speaking at that conference talked about some work that he was doing that I found absolutely unbelievable. I was just, it was, it was love at first sight. <laughs> I saw what this person was doing and I said, I have to do that. That is so amazing. And so I realized that the only person in the world who was doing exactly that kind of work was the guy who was speaking. And so I got back to uh, my you know, home and I started looking at where this guy was and I found out, oh, he's at the University of Illinois. I had never heard of the University of Illinois. I was not even considering the University of Illinois. Uh, but after I saw that this guy was there, his name, his name, by the way, is Nelson Leonard, who was my uh, research advisor. I decided to go to the University of Illinois. And so I applied to a handful of schools, but that was my number one choice because of this person. However, I have to caution against that particular approach because it's not 100% guaranteed that if you go to a university to work with a particular person that you're going to be able to work with that person. It sometimes happens that that person is full. You know, they might, there might be a lot of demand to work with that person and they can only take three students or five students in any given year. And, you know, there might be 10 students who want to work with that person. So I would never choose a university only for one person. I also made sure that there were other people at that university that were doing very stimulating work that I would be excited to do as well. And then that's what made Illinois a good fit for me. Um, the other factor is that sometimes the professors move, you know, they are at the university at, when you apply to it. And then the next year they move to another university, this happens or they retire, or, you know, things happen. So um, I would be a little cautious about going to work for one person, but that's kind of what I did. And in my case, it worked out really well. I got it accepted to the University of Illinois. I went there. And then the next step was getting accepted into this guy's research group. And um, I, he wouldn't take me right away. He said, "Stay. For, let's wait for a semester and then we'll see how things go. And after a semester, I went to his office and said, would you accept me into your research group? And he said, absolutely. And so that was it. So it worked out well for me. Nice, that's a great story of hard work and grit with a, a hint of caution at the same time. So that's great. Um, if I could, I, I'd love to, to share a bit about my you know, entry into to master's as well. And that was um, the field of sociology. And um, I, I didn't go for, because I knew what I wanted or I knew I wanted to um, work with. I just knew that I loved the, the, the subject and I was very fascinated and wanted to learn more, but I didn't know exactly what I wanted to learn more about. Um, so I'm really glad that I was able to 
go on and to, to study more and be able to find a particular interest that I liked with more in depth. So that was the reason that I went and I'm very glad that I, I went as well. Um, We've talked a bit about this, but can, can you share maybe more about some of the opportunities that your graduate degree unlocked once you ob obtained it? Um, okay, I can start. So um, definitely, I guess I'll repeat what I'm kind of summarized that a master's degree definitely uh, makes you more appealing candidate for some in some cases because they know you have gone through additional training and are more mature and have worked in more um, challenging environment and definitely have more depth as you said I think undergrad school is a breadth and then you go and a master a graduate school is the depth uh, you're getting uh, so for me it definitely helped me find a job faster I guess from uh, friends uh, who from college who who did not but that also has to do with a degree and the market and, and many other uh, conditions. And definitely PhD, I wouldn't be here today if I hadn't uh, the PhD. And um, yeah, I'm very glad I like the career I chose. And uh, so definitely if you're looking to, if you like, we, we do have, let me say that we, we do have lecturers and to be a lecturer in the university, you can have a master's degree. You don't need a PhD degree. So if you like teaching, uh, then uh, that's an option. Uh, to be a tenure, tenure line faculty, then you need um, to have a PhD. So in my case also, uh, the PhD was necessary to follow the academic pathway. And I became an assistant professor right after my postdoc. But um, one of the things that, that I should point out is when I ended my bachelor's degree, I knew what I liked. I told you I, I had this love at first sight relationship with, with the work that my advisor was doing. But I didn't know what I wanted my career path to be exactly. I mean, I knew I wanted to do faculty work. I wanted to teach and do research, but I didn't know what exactly I wanted to research. And while I was a graduate student, I became proficient at a particular kind of chemistry. So I'm a, I became a synthetic organic chemist, which means I could make molecules. And that's great, except I still didn't know exactly which molecules were worth making. But what happened was because I worked hard as a graduate student, my advisor was reasonably pleased with me because I was able to, you know, to actually push some of his ideas forward a little bit. And so he propelled me to the next level of my career. And he actually placed me in my postdoc position at Harvard with a, a, a professor at Harvard, uh, whose name is E.J. Corey, who uh, en ended up actually winning the Nobel Prize. So he ended up being an extremely um, prominent chemist. And the only reason I got to work with Professor Corey was because my PhD advisor saw something in me that he thought I could benefit from, and, and he thought you know it would be a good a good fit. Um, and then it, while I was working with Professor Corey, that's when the light bulb went off in my brain about what I wanted to work on as I became an independent professor and set up my own research. Uh, and I, I, I actually selected a sort of medicinal chemistry, and I, I started working on the development of new new approaches to making drugs for diabetes and for cancer. And then I spent the, the rest of my career basically, you know, working around those big questions that had originated in my mind while I was a, a postdoctoral researcher. So for me, Christy, the, the, the real benefit of the grad school, besides giving me the credential that allowed me to go on, was that it gave me the time to have my ideas mature about what I wanted to do, uh, you know, professionally for the rest of my career. Thank you for that. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. Okay, um, what, what advice would you give your, your former self, your younger self, about applying or going to graduate school? Like if, you, if, this was, if, this, if you were an audience member, like if you were a student right now, undergraduate student, what advice would you give based on your experience, lived experience? They start, <laughs> I'm trying to see <laughs> many years back. Um, so 
I would probably give the advice to not be scared. So I was back in, I, I, I'm born and raised in, in Greece and UK, which was where I ended up for my, my master's degree seemed very far. And I, uh, you, the United States sounded even uh, more scary. And if I was to go back in time, I now have many friends who, who did go there and maybe it was from different colleges with professors who had already studied in the US and kind of encouraged them to apply. I would probably open um, more opportunities to my younger self and apply to more schools and, and go beyond the Europe and let's say borders and, and also apply to US universities. Uh, because I think, uh, yeah, education here is very different. It's very unique. I mean, it's different. So I would like to have this different um, experience. And definitely there are top, top tier uh, faculty members in most of the universities, uh, at least the, the ones that have uh, graduate schools there. So, and even, even the undergraduate school. So I would probably do that differently. <laughs> All right, so let's see, advice I would give my former self. And it's hard for me because uh, as Magdalena said, it was a while ago, and in my case, quite a lot longer ago than it was for you, Magdalena. And uh, also because as a faculty member, I have now given advice to literally hundreds of other of students, maybe even thousands uh, about their graduate career. So I'm trying to parse all of this into something that I can say. The first thing I would say is this, um, Think clearly about what the right graduate degree is if you're considering graduate school. Um, if you want to get a PhD like I did, that's great. You can absolutely do it, but it's a serious time commitment. It's more than five years often. It requires intense work for much of that five years. And it's going to be occasionally discouraging, you know, especially when you're doing a new research project. Um, you're, you're trying to do something that's never been done before on the planet or in the universe. And so um, things happen, it doesn't always work. And then you get discouraged. And then, so you have to have a certain amount of resiliency. So the only way that you can actually succeed in that path is if you're really interested in what you're doing and you're really dedicated to what you're doing. So I would say, do pursue a PhD if those attributes exist for you. If you're not sure that you really love the subject, or if maybe you don't want to give a five-year time commitment, then maybe consider a master's degree. There might be a really good career path for you with a master's degree in, in, in your subject area. So that's the, the first thing is think clearly about what degree path you, you want. Um, the second thing is I, I want to talk a little bit about this um, notion of imposter syndrome. Uh, because I think that a lot of us feel like we're just not good enough for that particular path. You know, I, I certainly thought about this when I was going off to, to my PhD. I thought, gosh, am I going to be able to get a PhD? Do, you know, am I smart enough? Do I, will, I, will I be able to do this? Or, or am I going to understand the stuff that they teach me? And what I've learned over the years is that um, many people, I would even say most people feel some version of this. Uh, and you have to sort of overcome it. The, the, the short answer is yes, you can succeed. It's about hard work. If you're willing to do the hard work, you absolutely can succeed. Um, it's, it's perfectly common to feel like you're not cut out for something, that you're not good enough for something. But interestingly, People who feel that way often are the best qualified. Uh, people who are really capable are the ones who understand best how, how much is gonna be required to achieve it and they're the most timid about it. So there's some correlation actually between feeling that imposter syndrome and actually being well qualified for success. Um, so don't let that imposter syndrome feeling um, be the, the, the limitation. Don't, don't stop yourself from something that you really want to do. That's the second piece of advice I would give. The third piece of advice I would give is apply to more, more than one school. Make sure that you're looking at a few different places and you should work with your mentors as an undergraduate to pick what are the right places for you based on your career interests, your academic background and so forth. 
pick a handful of places. I, I won't tell you how many, but I would say at a bare minimum three and at a bare maximum 15, somewhere in, in that range, so, sounds right to me. Um, and then once you have a collection of acceptances, once you have two or three places that you're accepted, really dig in and find out what it's like to be at those places. Um, go visit them. Go talk to people who are in the program that you have been accepted to. Find out what their lived experience is. Find out if they're happy. Find out if they're fulfilled. Find out if they're stressed. Find out what's going on uh, with them. Uh, talk to some of the faculty members with whom you're going to be working. Find out if there are people that you could actually interact with or if there are people, you know, sometimes like with me, it's a love connection. Other times you realize I can never, I, I, if I have to sit in a classroom with this person, I'm going to go crazy, right? So um, do the homework to find out what the best fit is and then accept based on that. So those are the, those are the bits of advice that I, I guess I would give. Yeah, and, and to follow up on, on Mark's advice, and which is, yeah, I kind of hinted to that, uh, that have many op op options open and what is good fit for somebody is not necessarily the same for everybody. It doesn't have to be the top school that is a good fit for you because maybe the top school has 500 people in the classroom and you don't want smaller classes, 30 people, and you get the attention of your professor and then they know you. It's so figure out more details about the program you want to join and also what is the focus area. So, uh, I mean, speaking, we are in San Jose State University. We don't have a PhD program, but we do have very strong master's programs, master's degrees, and uh, our focus is much more hands-on than what you would get in, in, in UCs, just because we know that people after graduate school, they will go and work for the industry and they need the hands-on experience versus, uh, if you want um, to, if you go to a school that has a PhD program, they the training is somewhat different. So make sure that you, as, as Mark said, visit, talk to people, talk to alumni or, or, or other students, uh, meet with the professor and find out more about what is actually better fit for, to, for what your um, final goal is, I guess, yeah. Yeah, I think you've both given some really good advice. Um, and I think that is crucial, making sure that number one, you understand what you want to get out of a graduate program and then finding a graduate program that actually gives you that outcome. I think that's really great advice. And Mark, if I could just make a statement about you know, this, this concept of imposter syndrome. Um, I really appreciate that because I was a, number one, I was a first generation bachelor's student um, so at that point, going to graduate school, I didn't have a role model. I didn't know what I was doing or why. I, I, I don't know that I knew why I wanted to go to graduate school, except I wanted to study more about the topic. Um, so I, I think especially when I went to a research one institute for my PhD, being able to find a group of students that can support you, that can kind of walk you through that experience, that you can support each other. <laughs> Um, along the way, because many times students are, a lot of students are feeling that same imposter syndrome and being able to support one another was what kind of cut me through and then through their first year of, of the program. So I think that that's a really good statement. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, I, I don't have any other questions that I'm seeing. Um, Fernando, I don't know if you have any other questions that you want to bring forward um, to our panel. I don't have any questions, but I think my advice would also be to, uh, if you are going to be applying to multiple schools, um, ask if they have any fee waivers for their application, because it does get a little bit expensive, even if you're applying to only a handful. Um, you'd be surprised with the amount of schools, especially private schools, that do have those waivers for students. I'll, I'll say one final thing. Uh, if you're considering graduate school at SJSU, I just want you to know that the College of Graduate Studies is here to support you, as Christy said. We do have uh, a lot of very high quality uh, master's programs and a few doctoral programs, no PhDs yet, but a few doctoral programs. And uh, we have um, a variety of scholarship opportunities. So if you apply, please do submit your FAFSA form. This is the federal form that uh, the financial aid form. 
uh, and that way you'll get put into the pool for uh, scholarships for which you're eligible. And in some departments, there are also uh, uh, work opportunities like teaching associate uh, or research assistant. Uh, and then we have other kinds of uh, jobs available on campus like writing tutor and things like that. So there are other support mechanisms. So I just wanted to say, if you're considering grad school at SJSU, please explore some of these opportunities uh, as you consider your application. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, um, Dean DeLarco. Thank you, Dr. Aronofsky. We really appreciate your time this morning and sharing with us about why um, to consider graduate school.